Okay, uh, welcome back everyone to the second half of this seminar, this MENA stakeholder seminar uh, titled From Ben Ali to Democracy and Rule of Law. The first half we had a Tunisian panel with the Tunisian perspective on the, this transitional period. Uh, this second panel will have a little bit more of an international, maybe regional focus on the issue. and. Uh, it will be conducted by Roger Williams, who is program manager for the ILAC MENA program. Uh, and I think just, uh, just give the floor to you, Roger, please. Okay, thanks very much. This seems to be working. Uh, uh, my name is Roger Williams. I am the program manager um, for the Middle East and North Africa regional program um, of ILAC. And it is a great honor today to be able to be moderator uh, for this panel which will be moving the focus from a very broad one, looking at what has worked um, and what has contributed to the success of uh, the Tunisian transition to democracy so far, um, to a narrower focus looking at the issue of judicial training um, as a component of broader judicial reform. Uh, we have very distinguished panelists today um, beginning with Mr. Samir Anabi, the chairman of Tunisia's National Anti-Corruption Agency. Mr. Imed Darouish, uh, a judge and the director of the High Judicial Institute, the Institut Supérieur de la Magistrature. Excuse my French. Um, Mr. Joel Martin, uh, who has been uh, leading the Sealy courses, um, the Sealy Institute and the International Bar Association are the two uh, ILAC member organizations um, that have been doing trainings for sitting judges in Tunisia um, in a first phase for 18 months uh, up until the end of last year and have now begun a new second phase in which uh, it is their ambition to reach all sitting judges in the country. Um, also with us is Ms. Ivana Herlichkova, who sits on the Hariri Tribunal in The Hague, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, um, and is also a regular uh, lecturer um, in the Sealy Institute trainings. Um, I will not uh, engage in any lengthy introduction of the topic other than to say that judicial training is a fascinating topic, a uh, contested topic. Um, it involves uh, bringing expertise from outside. That expertise can always, of course, be helpful and bring fresh perspectives. Um, but it is, of course, always important uh, to avoid assuming things about the legal system in, when, in, in which one is operating and, and, and trying to contribute. Um, and I think there's been a long learning experience um, with regard to this kind of training over the last decades. Um, and I think that we are part of that now. So in looking at the effects of the particular training um, that we've been involved in as ILAC, I think it's important to also step back and look at the broader discourses around rule of law assistance um, and the role of international experts in these types of, of transitions. Um, and how this type of work can be done more effectively and, and continue to play a more and more constructive role in these types of democratic transitions. So, without further ado, I'd like to hand the word to Mr. Anabi. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, I would like uh, first to welcome all of you here in Tunisia as a Tunisian citizen. Uh, and I would like to apologize for two things. Excuse me for perhaps I'm not in a good health condition, but I made the point to come over here and talk with you and see many of you whom I met about two years ago in, in Stockholm. And I also would like to apologize for the weather outside. <laughs> it's not usual Tunisian weather in this time of the year, but it's in the, within the transitional period we are li li living 
in, in, in Tunisia. And uh, I was wondering how I could be, or how I could bring an international uh, view on the topic of today, being a Tunisian here, living within this system, but I try to think about it in a rather unusual uh, way, let me see, uh, let me say. Well, the other problem is what language should I use? Uh, should I continue in English or uh, in Arabic and give some break to the interpreters? Uh, but we always have a language problem in Tunisia. I know, and I apologize for my American friends uh, being here. In America, I think you say someone who speaks three languages is trilingual person. And someone who speaks two languages is a bilingual person. And the person who speaks one language is an American. <laughs> but there is one additional category that you do not, you do not perhaps know. You have people who speak two half languages. And in Tunisia, in fact, most of the time we speak two half languages, Arabic and French. It's a mixture of Arabic and French. So, well, let me try to do it in English this time in, uh, in order to practice my English. Uh, I noticed that all the important things that happened in Tunisia uh, I wouldn't say after the revolution, because the revolution is not something which takes place within a certain frame of time. It's a, it's a continuous process. So we do not really know when it started and when it is going to finish, if it ever finishes. So what took place, the major changes that took place in Tunisia, let's say since December 2010, took place outside the official legal frameworks. Just to give you an example, and I wish uh, some of the speakers of the first, first panel were here, uh, we had this uh, commission on political reforms, and uh, which was not elected, but it was an unofficial uh, parliament in a way. We were, I, I had the chance to be a member of this commission to think about uh, political reform, about the democratic transition, uh, and many other things. It's within this <coughs> commission that most of the important laws enacted after uh, the revolution were prepared. And in fact, the basic law, the election law, was prepared by this commission, and uh, a commission that had no, uh, let's say, legitimacy from the legal point of view. But it was a spontaneous meeting of people, and it was only a few weeks after uh, it convened that there was an official uh, text uh, an official bill uh, to give it a formal existence. And this process continued even after the elections we had in uh, 2011. And as you have uh, noticed earlier, it was not the parliament or the national uh, constituent assembly that really imposed the new constitution. The basic problems were solved outside the National Constituent Assembly, thanks to this quartet, and thanks to a consensus within uh, the social society. They imposed their points of view to the members of the National Constituent Assembly. And this is happening even today. Where, we are, where, where they are discussing the uh, law on the election law, and there is not uh, a serious consensus about some of the uh, basic uh, articles or provisions of this law, and the decision is being t 
taken outside this official uh, uh, body uh, by consultations among the parties, by consultations between the members of the quartet and the political parties, etc. So how can we talk about uh, rule of law when things are being taken outside the ordinary legal uh, channels? That's one question I wanted to, to put, uh, and perhaps for discussion, because I don't have any answer. The only answer, perhaps, uh, or, uh, is that we are living into uh, a new political philosophy, where accountability is not a matter of waiting the time of the end of the term of office to be to get re-elected or not re-elected, to be sanctioned or not sanctioned by the vote of the people, but now there is a daily accountability to the social, social society. Social society is being very active. The social society imposed all these new changes taking place outside the traditional uh, legal uh, uh, channels. Uh, now, to come back to the uh, uh, major challenge I personally met over the past uh, few months uh, relating to the judicial system in Tunisia. And that's, the, I believe, the emphasis of our panel here. Uh, we were faced with a very peculiar situation. We were in the process of writing a constitution and it was out of question not to talk about the independence of the judicial power within this constitution. Uh, nobody would accept that. Even though uh, the uh, very conditions of the uh, independence of the judiciary are not present in the Tunisian system. Because uh, we did not have an independent judiciary in Tunisia. Uh, we uh, had I would say 80% uh, of the judges were subject to the orders coming from the executive branch. And this situation took place over the past 20 years, I believe, of the uh, Ben Ali's rule. Uh, so, uh, as a whole, the judicial system lost the confidence of the population, of the people. And that's, you know, a very important aspect of measuring uh, the independence of the judiciary. The training of the judges, and I believe that at least two-thirds of the practicing judges today went through a special training in the Institut Supérieur de la Magistrature, which is the school for training uh, judges. And as I know, as you know here, we have a practically a very strict separation between judges and lawyers. Although in the law, there could be some way of communicating, but in practice, there is no such communication except for judges when they reach the retirement age, many of them would join the bar. So, uh, I said that about two-thirds of the judges in practice in 2011 went through this school uh, of training uh, of judges, which was not, in my opinion, a school preparing for an independent judiciary. Most of the teaching was to have some obedient judges submitted to the uh, 
executive branch of the government. So how can you imagine overnight to give independence to this body, which was not prepared to be to think independently, to decide independently on the cases they have. Uh, and yet we cannot say we are against the independence of the judiciary, especially from someone who was uh, on the side of uh, practicing law. So something had to be done in this respect. The other aspect of the problem is that the judges who were in office in 2011 got involved in the political process. And they wanted to have a say in the political process. And perhaps this political action went a little too far. Just to give you a couple of examples, the Union of Magistrates and the Association of Magistrates took political stance for what was taking place in Egypt and in Sudan. I don't see why uh, they would get involved in, in external political affairs, but even trying to take stance on local political issues. And yet, we have to remember uh, the two major reasons for the independence of the judiciary. One, it was decided that the, the judiciary should be an independent body. This was due to two philosophical backgrounds. One is that the judges, unlike the legislators and the executive officers of the government, have a professional training. They have to have a, a law degree before getting into the practice of law. And this professional training is two-sided. One side is scientific body of law, and the other side is the code of conduct, which is a very strict code of conduct that most politicians do not follow. But the second side of the independence of the condition is that judges should keep away from practicing politics. They are not allowed to get into politics. So we were facing a real dilemma here uh, when uh, the legislators uh, were trying to, to write the provisions on the independence of the uh, judiciary, and as you know, the judiciary here includes both the uh, ordinary judiciary, the ordinary courts, the administrative courts, and the financial courts. And finally, the law, the constitution was passed, but in my opinion, this is not enough because we are going to have some serious problems if the judges are going to continue in getting involved in politics. And we already had some very, very serious uh, fights between lawyers and uh, judges on this matter, uh, getting even to some unfortunate uh, situations. Uh, this is why I believe it's of the utmost importance today to try to give a new education to the judges who are in place and to the future judges. And the action that ILAC is taking in this respect is very valuable to us. Uh, however, I had the chance to talk with Christian in the past few months. We have to, go, to give perhaps a little more attention to the content of this uh, uh, program of training uh, judges taking into account this particular situation of Tunisia. I'll stop here and perhaps at the period of discussion I'll answer some questions. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Anabi. And I think you provided an ideal transition um, for the next speaker, uh, who is in charge now um, of the training of new judges. Uh, the relationship between the training that ILAC um, is doing through the Seeley Institute and the International Bar Association of sitting judges um, and the development of new uh, post-2011 curricula um, and approaches to the training of new judges is a very interesting one. Um, and I look forward very much, uh, Mr. Darwish, to your exposition um, of the developments at the Institute. Shukran. Thank you. Uh, actually, I prefer to, to talk uh, in Arabic for a simple reason. And, and that is uh, that is my m mastery of English uh, uh, is not as uh, good as that of Mr. Samir Annabi. I would like also to say that uh, actually that uh, I do not share his opinion on everything he said because uh, because this uh, requires some relativity. Uh, for for, uh, for some of the uh, issues he mentioned, uh, we are now uh, 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 facing a, a constitution. Uh, this constitution uh, uh, came with new things. Uh, uh, there was a renovation or innovation uh, at two levels with respect to the uh, judiciary power uh, for with regards our discussion here. The first thing is the uh, uh, underlining the uh, competence of the judge and in, in, and in, and in my, to my knowledge, uh, constitutions do not uh, mention this uh, quality in judges. This conditions, Article 103 of the Constitution, uh, states uh, that uh, that the judge must be competent. Uh, this is uh, a very uh, uh, obvious uh, uh, condition that is we're not used to see in constitutions. That uh, that uh, uh, article. Uh, 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 emphasizes the method uh, that uh, the judge should use, that is impartiality, integrity, and uh, and this uh, this means independence. Uh, why these conditions? Uh, these are conditions found in Article One or Three, so that uh, the judge can carry out his. Uh, 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 work that was included in Article 102 in the Constitution, the previous article. Uh, these uh, tasks uh, are clear in Article 103, uh, include uh, um, that is uh, to uh, uh, establish a just the uh, sovereignty of the Constitution, the, uh, the rule of law, the protections of rights and liberties. Uh, and then uh, uh, the article adds uh, that the judge is independent. Uh, how uh, ca can we evaluate this innovation in the Constitution? Uh, here, I, uh, I agree with Mr. Annabi that this uh, uh, came to break away from a situation that uh, uh, the, the judge did not the judges to be independent. Uh, uh, while the, uh, the but uh, uh, but uh, I think this is a personal uh, issue uh, because. Uh, uh, because a independence is a personal conviction uh, because uh, 
the Constitution may mention independence, and I want to be independent. So it is a question of ethics, of judiciary ethics, more than a political will. Uh, this is uh, uh, this was also mentioned by Mr. Annabi. But uh, uh, judicial ethics, uh, we don't have now in Tunisia uh, a code of ethics for for judges. This is true. But this does not mean that uh, we don't have uh, rules for judicial ethics. Uh, uh, and now, now the Constitution now is in effect, uh, given that uh, the Constitution is a sovereign above all texts, but also uh, even in the law of 1967 uh, pertaining to the bylaws of uh, the provisions of judges, there were provisions uh, uh, pertaining to some aspects of uh, the ethics of the judge, Article 23 and 24, for example. And also in Tunisia, we, we have in our culture and in our her Arab Islamic uh, heritage in the uh, uh, different uh, civilizations in our country, we have uh, uh, things that uh, what will make us proud of having uh, judicial ethics in the past. And then we uh, teach uh, 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 um, uh, uh, a course in the High Institute of Magistrate, which is, which is uh, the uh, topic of uh, judicial ethics. And it is not uh, taught uh, only to judges or those who will become judges which I have not yet become judges, it is also taught uh, uh, for the bailiffs, uh, for notary publics, uh, for clerks, uh, court clerks, because uh, uh, all of those are under the supervision of the High Institute of Magistrate. So, so this already exists in reality. The High Institute of Magistrate in Tunisia was uh, uh, created in 1985. And the uh, bylaws of that uh, uh, institute uh, started in 1985, in 1989, and 1992, and 1999, and they stopped at that time. The teaching method at the Institute of Magistrate and its uh, structure, the uh, uh, lessons taught uh, uh, in the Institute, uh, all of this uh, is uh, uh, governed by old uh, uh, texts, uh, law, laws. Uh, uh, in addition to the uh, th these uh, texts, uh, which uh, should now be changed, I'm saying today, but uh, actual, actually, uh, we should have we, sh we should have uh, uh, started doing that at the beginning of the revolution, because now we are now we are talking about a revolution. We are now in the fourth year after the revolution. Uh, from the first year, then uh, uh, we thought about it, it sh by uh, amending or modifying uh, uh, the uh, bylaws, uh, the High Institute uh, and High Council Magistrate, etc. This didn't take place. I agree with Mr. Anebi politically, but uh, there was at least a, a, a provisional. Uh, uh, a body uh, for uh, uh, the judiciary, uh, and this uh, committee or body uh, uh, has as prerogative uh, to give advisory uh, opinion on all texts that have to do with the judiciary, uh, including what happened a couple of days ago, 
and that is the body gave its uh, uh, opinion on a specialized chambers that were uh, uh, that uh, people uh, uh, talked about about creating it after the ruling of the uh, 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 Court of Appeal and uh, and uh, they gave their opinion no for setting up these courts or chambers also this committee uh, was uh, uh, it was asked uh, to give its opinion on uh, on reducing the period for training the judges this year in the High Institute of Magistrate. So the decree that will appear in the official Gazette, uh, you will see that it will says that it will say that after looking at the opinion or considering the opinion of the uh, committee. Uh, 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 so this is a first uh, a step towards setting up uh, uh, independence. Also, uh, at the High Institute of Magistrate, uh, there was a, a draft law to uh, amend the uh, text that govern this uh, uh, institute in all of its uh, functions. The the, the the teaching the teaching staff the curriculum training etc of course uh, when we talk about uh, training we also have to talk about training the trainers because you cannot ensure sound training if you do not ensure the training of those who train uh, uh, this is also uh, something that we looked into. Uh, 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 waiting to uh, uh, look into that project in an official way and that it will be studied by uh, uh, the uh, appropriate uh, party. Uh, and it was uh, actually, and I was. Uh, 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 and uh, this Center for uh, Judicial Studies have given its opinion on this. Uh, and uh, and I know that, uh, so I think that there is, <clears throat> so, uh, so that uh, uh, to change the training period for three years, also at the level, at the, at the curriculum, and in this uh, uh, training also, there are two types of training. There is a, a training for those who will become judges, and which is called the basic training. And there is also uh, the uh, continuous training, and that is uh, and that, uh, that type of training uh, covers uh, uh, judges that are now in courts. Uh, in in both cases, we uh, we uh, count on uh, uh, on uh, speeding up uh, the uh, uh, completion of the draft law because uh, uh, this uh, law. Uh, th by uh, looking at the the existing uh, 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 systems in comparative law, this uh, will lay the foundation for a system that uh, will uh, give its uh, uh, fruits at the uh, level of training. For example, we will have more emphasis on practical issues rather than theoretical issues because the theoretical training is supposed to be a prerequisite for those who come to the institute and although although this may so uh, the but uh, but there is a, 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 a uh, 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 there are topics uh, that are not taught in, in at uh, at the universities or or not in all universities in all uh, schools of law uh, like the tax law, the real estate law, 
uh, we hope uh, that uh, uh, this uh, will be part of the lessons uh, uh, given as uh, an additional training for this theoretical training. There is there are also uh, other things that should be emphasized, and that is the methodology uh, uh, used by the judge. How does the judge uh, function? How does he look in cases uh, a bit in his hands? And uh, this is something also we included in the draft law. There are also the uh, uh, training, other trainings, uh, trainings in courts and other institutions. Uh, there are also. Uh, uh, there is uh, the, another issue, which is this, the structure. That is, we have we have to create a position for the training for the direct director of training, because a training is more important than uh, uh, theoretical lessons, and this, of course, has to be done in coordination between the uh, institute and the courts. Uh, where this training takes takes place so that we can ensure a practical training for the judge because the institute is not an, just an academic institution but it prepares people for competence so that they can perform a noble profession which is a judiciary we also need the continuous training because uh, because uh, it is uh, it it's only uh, given to the judges in the f their first 6 years uh, the rest of the judiciary though the judges may attend these training sessions but uh, in reality uh, even uh, those who are required by law to come and attend they don't come so we have uh, to uh, rethink this issue because uh, because you never you have not fully trained uh, uh, training should be continued all the time until uh, the end uh, of the judge's uh, uh, career and of course within this uh, continuous training uh, there is cooperation between the high institute of magistrate and the rest of institutions like ELAC, for example, here, who and we should not uh, 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 ignore the fact. Uh, I'm not, of course, uh, I'm not talking about uh, uh, the, uh, the programs in the past uh, and, and, and those that are supposed to be uh, uh, implemented, uh, knowing that. Uh, that uh, the attacks that were mentioned by Mr. An Nabi a while ago uh, in this transitional period, uh, the High Institute of Magistrate uh, uh, has uh, has organized several sessions uh, on uh, transitional training on uh, terrorism, terrorist crimes, etc. So this uh, as a general summary, and I. Uh, and like uh, uh, Mr. Annebi, uh, I will be uh, happy to answer your question later. And thank you.
This is from my country, Czech Republic, as we went through the procedure of transition of judiciary and other countries. I found that uh, there we have a lot of in common. There is many, there are many similar things in Tunisian example and other countries. And it was uh, quite amazing to see how the judges in the training uh, appreciated sharing the experiences and practical examples and also some potential solution and uh, use them in uh, in the society here. So, and what also they appreciated very much was the understanding the situation they are in because they found very difficult the procedure of transition of judiciary, even if they were keen to change some things. Uh, so I summarized uh, very briefly 10 important points I found uh, important and interesting, uh, very similar in Tunisia and other countries in procedure of transition of judiciary. First, and I think is the key, is the independence of judiciary and uh, the understanding, the meaning of the independence. Because in, in the past, there was no independence of judiciary here as in the co other countries, and uh, judges were considered to be just uh, one kind of state clerks with no independence. So now the judges know that they want independent judiciary, but uh, no judges nor the public really understand in reality what really means the independence. And that's very difficult to achieve something if you don't understand what does it mean. And uh, there are no legal rules for uh, promoting legislation, what uh, we found also difficult in, in my country, like no legislation about judges and court, no transparent rules for disciplinary procedure for judges and, and so on. So uh, the independence of judiciary was a hot topic, I can say, and uh, the ju ju judges here really appreciated and welcomed a lot of practical examples. The second is a lack or a low level of public trust uh, to judiciary, because also in the past there, were no, there was no public trust to judiciary, and it's uh, quite difficult, it's long procedure to change the situation and to increase the public trust to judiciary, and it, uh, it's quite important for judges to, to understand and to get inspiration how they can work to uh, increase the public trust to judiciary, but also to understand that uh, no one else can do that, that the judges should work on that. It's very difficult uh, imagine that someone else will work on, on this. And uh, also some solu potential solution like public education, uh, open uh, court trials, uh, inviting schools to, to the courts, explaining judicial work, and also uh, professional behavior can, can help. So, it's common in other countries. Another very important point uh, is uh, working conditions, court administration, and backload on courts. Judges are overloaded, have a lot of files, so it's very difficult for them even to imagine that can, they can work on something like uh, increasing public trust to judiciary. Usually they have very low salary, so they have to deal with such very practical things. It means that uh, for them it's very difficult to finish cases without any delay, which means that judiciary is slow and it's a matter of critics, of professional and uh, public as well. And this, this problem is really common in, in other post-revolution countries. And uh, we talk about many practical examples which can be implemented, I believe, also in Indonesia, like for example, to improve court administration with uh, specially trained clerks who can, after some rules, deal with very simple judicial work, which means the judges can deal with more difficult things, uh, to change procedure rules, because writing a judgment in, in this country is, like was my country, is a nightmare for a judge, because it means a lot of really bureaucratic work without any real sense. Uh, so after changing some procedure rules in simple cases that maybe the reasoning of the judgment may be very simple and uh, to have assistance at the courts, also uh, to work with computers and so on. Uh, fourth 
important things I found that uh, for judges it's uh, fascinating and important to learn how to discuss interactively the problems because in the past they didn't talk even to each other and to, to other legal professions so they really enjoyed interactive training and they learned a lot as they said and they appreciate it which means that they understand and judges should be active but uh, also, it's a matter of practice on other examples, how to find a balance to be, to be active but independent uh, at the same time. And uh, also how to deal with professional organization of uh, judges like uh, Judicial Union, Judicial Association. And uh, the difficulties in, in this matter in Tunisia was obvious, but uh, I believe that the helpful example from other countries, also supporting from the international organization, can help a lot. And uh, as well as a judicial, national and international network, because for judges, uh, this training for most of them, or many of them, was the first time they met each other. So even within the country, they could establish some unofficial or official judicial network. And also, they, uh, because all of them they speak French, so it's very easy to be uh, in touch with uh, international colleagues, and it's it's a great support. Then. Uh, also, it's connected to independence, the role of the judges in the society, because in the past it was just a matter of administrative work, but uh, now independent judge means different role in the society, so the role of the Supreme Council for Judiciary uh, to establish new legislation for judges, but also, uh, of course, judges can never be legislators, but uh, they are so experienced, so their comments to new legislation from the practical point can be very useful and can avoid many mistakes in uh, adopting new legislation. A big topic is judges and media, and I think all the post-revolution countries has had the problem, as the problem was, uh, was here, so it was a topic for uh, training and discussion. Also, learning from uh, other countries, but not only positive example, but also from the mistakes, which is sometimes even more useful. And uh, what really, it was fascinating how the judges uh, when understand that we civil law judges in the beginning always thought, what can we learn from the common law judges? But there is a lot of we can learn from common law colleagues and it can be really useful, especially in the matter of independence of judiciary. Another big topic is the loyalty among judiciary and I think it's very important uh, to avoid some false loyalty among judges because it can lead to uh, some disciplinary procedure and if judges can be critical to the colleagues who don't behave well, then they can avoid uh, some impact from outside of judiciary. Uh, the role of women judges in society, it's, it's also so important and uh, in the training where it was a group of 30 judges, uh, probably around 30% of participants were women and it was quite uh, interesting to see that uh, some of them were wearing hijab, a traditional scarf, some of them uh, enjoyed dressing in, in very western way and uh, both groups were happy with that and they said that uh, before the revolution they were not allowed wearing scarf as judges. So they considered it as a wonderful sign of freedom of, exp of expression that they can wear what they really, what they really want. And, and the last, in this brief summary, is a, a big topic, how to combine culture, traditions, and specific on the country with international standards of human rights and uh, the rule of law. And uh, Tunisia, I think, can be a really model country for, for many other countries because there is a rich history rich culture and legal traditions which can help in establishing rule of law and independent and uh, professional uh, judiciary. So uh, from my, my perspective, uh, the Tunisian training are um, 
very special in that point that Tunisian judges are active and sharing experience and learning from, from other can be very useful to establish uh, independent judiciary and uh, rule of law. I think each topic I mentioned can be discussed for a long time, so an interesting question we can discuss. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ivana. I think there will be some very interesting discussion following this, but I would like to take the opportunity, since Mr. Anabi needs to leave at about four, um, to just see if I could jump in and take any questions specifically for him. Do you have time for that, sir? Great. Okay. So if there are any questions specifically uh, for Samir Anabi, maybe we could take two or three. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Kabine Jane. I come from Liberia a country that has also experienced the kind of transition that you have today. You specifically mentioned, and I think all of the members here, uh, focusing on independence of the judiciary. I am aware that the issue of independence of the judiciary is one that sparkles a number of questions. For us in Liberia, our experience has been that key to independence of any judiciary as an institution is also a question of resources that are guaranteed for the workings of the judiciary as an institution. You can talk about all the legal framework Politicians, including both the national legislature as parliament and executive, can ensure that those laws you put in there do not work because they do not give the judiciary the money it needs to function effectively. From your experience, what do you see in terms of guaranteed legal framework? maybe contained in your draft constitution or the constitution you have today to ensure that that independence is also one that guarantees minimum national budgetary support to the judiciary. Thank you. Could we maybe uh, take one or two more questions? Yeah, Hans. My name is Ayman Ayari. I'm a judge in the real estate court. I'd like to ask a question to Professor Annebi. The, the concept of the independence of the judiciary is not purely legal, but a personal independence. We can promulgate excellent laws, but uh, the judge still is not independent. In, in com uh, the concept of uh, independence of the judiciary before and after the revolution differs. Uh, after the revolution, the, the independence of the judge uh, of the judiciary has become personal because in Tunisia we have laws that uh, amount to a perfect uh, uh, laws. I'd like to ask a question to Professor Anebi. What do you think about the adoption of uh, media uh, uh, media programs uh, in order to impact the proceedings of the judiciary? in Kahoot with the lawyers. Uh, after the revolution, we've noticed that uh, many media uh, uh, TV programs have been staged in order to impact the decisions of the judiciary, which uh, uh, and uh, in uh, Kahoot with the uh, lawyering profession. We know that uh, the lawyers are our colleagues. They are the ones who have taught us uh, the business of uh, uh, the judicial business. Thank you very much, Hans Corell, former legal counsel of the United Nations and former judge of appeal. There is one thing, Mr. Anabi, you said that attracted my attention, and that was judges should not get involved in party politics. I cannot stress enough how important is this, and the reason I take the floor is to relay a message from a discussion among judges from several countries, the highest court in the World Justice Forum, where this question was discussed, and there was unanimous 
uh, opinion among them that judges should not do that. And the International Bar Association is actually looking into this in a country where judges are elected and where in a particular case they were not re-elected because they had ruled in a particular way. So I am grateful that you made that observation and I hope that this idea will spread around the world. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Annaby, would you like to respond? More questions. Should we take a few more? Uh, yeah. Yep. Shelby? Shelby Quast. And I, I had a question. You mentioned that um, the rule of law change, if it happens outside the formal legal system, can it be considered rule of law? And I'm wondering if in the situation of the country in transition, would it have been more or less progressive, these changes, if it had happened in the formal legal system? And would it have been more or less inclusive of the wider society if it had happened in the formal legal system? Great. Elizabeth? I took off my glasses when I meant to take off my headphones. Um, so <laughs> so I'm, I'm Elizabeth Howe, and, and I'm the general counsel of the International Association of Prosecutors. Uh, and just uh, speaking about the uh, independence of the judiciary, which I think takes many aspects, and there needs to be many uh, checks and balances and protections. But I just want to ask a question about prosecutors in, in Tunisia because I know that prosecutors are members of the judiciary and they come from the same stable as the judiciary, but they do have a different function. And um, I speak um, on behalf of an association which is very keen to promote the independence of prosecutors, not only from the executive, but also arguably from the judiciary. And there are many uh, countries now in the Middle East um, as well as elsewhere which are now embracing this as a concept whereby they think there should be a disjunct between the role of the prosecutor who pleads before the court um, and who um, uh, deals with, with, with cases and makes decisions about cases and whether they should go before the court and the role of the judge who, who makes the decision uh, about the cases. And, and I'd just like to have um, your um, comments um, on that, Mr. Annabee, and, and also perhaps later on, I'd be very interested to hear from uh, Mr. Darouish about um, that also. Thank you. Okay, one last question. Uh, is that okay? One last question. Uh, just over here. Uh, Peter Maynard, ILAC member, and also IBA. A qu question for my friend, Mr. Anabi. Um, as um, head of the anti-corruption agency, I, I, I want to, to hear your views on the role of the agency in, in connection with the transition process. Um, asset tracing and recovery is my preferred area of practice, and I do think that uh, agencies such as yours are really critical in, in, in restoring confidence um, in the justice system. Um, would you give some views on the role of the anti-corruption agency in the process here? Mr. Annaby? Yes. Is that a sufficiency of questions? <laughs> well, that's the price of being uh, politically incorrect. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I try to answer some of these questions. I'm not sure I have answers to all the questions, though. Uh, the key of independence uh, of the judiciary uh, is the resources, you said. Uh, I am not quite sure. Uh, and I'm going to uh, be perhaps very practical in answering. Uh, in Tunisia, judges until uh, maybe 
the early 80s were not well paid. I know that because I lived in a legal family and my father was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and when he passed away in 1975, my brother and I had to pay, to pay his debts. So this is to tell you. And yet we did not know many of the uh, decisions uh, that were criticized for not being independent at that time. But uh, beginning in the uh, early or mid 80s, the judges are the best paid profession in Tunisia. Perhaps next to the university professors, but very close to them. So uh, this is not uh, a key to independence in my view. And I always wondered why in Egypt, for example, uh, the judiciary was very badly paid and corruption was existing everywhere within the uh, governmental structure in Egypt except in the judiciary. I don't know, my friend Omar here he agrees with me or not. At least until 2006, it's only 2006 was a turning point. I always wondered why the judges never got corrupt in Egypt. It was an exception to the whole society. The only explanation I found is that there was a very strong British tradition within the judiciary in Egypt and also the high quality of training of Egyptian judges. That's the only explanation I could find myself. I might be wrong, but that's the case. So it, it's not only a matter of resources. Uh, on the other side, I don't want to uh, indicate which country, but in a, an Arab country, they have a saying that the honest judge is he who would pay back the losing party. So at the start, <laughs> they would get from both uh, parties, and when the party loses, then they give back the bribe they got. For, uh, so, you see, it's not necessarily, you know, a matter of uh, being paid, but um, I think a matter of training of the judges uh, is more basic to that. Uh, now, to come to uh, the question about uh, using uh, the media to influence the judiciary, it's a very interesting question. Uh, I am against the appearance of lawyers on TV, talks and shows, etc. That's my own conviction. I always refused that. But that does not mean that the judiciary should be kept away from any criticism. Like any other uh, political or public uh, body in the country, everyone should be accountable to the people. And this is why when I see propositions that they should not subject to control or to criticism from the press, this is unacceptable to me. This was perhaps true in the past, but now that's my personal opinion. Everyone should be accountable. And the ultimate accountability is to the representatives of the people. So, uh, and that's the basic side uh, practical side of democracy. Uh, and more so if they want to get involved into politics. I, 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 I never understood the position of the uh, union of lawyers or the association of lawyers who 
very strongly defend the right to express their political opinions uh, in the media or on their uh, 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 Facebook uh, accounts or anything like that. And I believe that the, uh, the event I pointed out to uh, during my talk about this big fight between the lawyers and the judges was due to the fact that the concerned judge was publishing his political opinions on his Facebook account. So they knew that he was politically engaged and that his action was taken as a political action and that so, uh, uh, in consequence he could not be uh, protected by the independence of the judiciary. So this is why I think it is a very basic issue for our judges not to be politically active, at least in terms of belonging or expressing a political point of view. They have their own opinions. I, know, I think, uh, if I'm, I might be wrong, but I remember that in the United States, the judges get a special compensation for not being socially active in, political, uh, in the political life. I think there is a special indemnity paid to judges. I, I might be wrong. No, it doesn't exist. I, so I am wrong, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> Mr. It should exist in Tunisia, I think. <laughs> I, I'm very sorry, I've realized as, as chair, I've neglected my duties and we're a bit over time. If I could ask you to wrap up quickly, just so we could get the last speaker in. Be, I'm, I'm sorry to rush you. It's all right. Uh, uh, well, the question of the independence of the prosecutors is, is a very, I don't think there is a very clear uh, stand uh, theoretically or in practice. I, I am not for the independence of the pro prosecutors because I believe that as they represent the public interest, theoretically, at least in our legal system, which is very different from the Anglo-Saxon system. In our system, the executive has all the information about and the, the responsibility for the uh, uh, criminal uh, justice policy. So they have more information about this system than the practicing uh, judges, independent judges. But I think, and this is accepted in the French legal system, you might convey the, you should convey the opinion of the executive regarding a specific case, but you can express openly that you are of a different opinion. They have a saying in French, uh, la plume est serve, la parole est libre. So writing, you are subject to obey the uh, orders, but orally you can defend a different point of view. Uh, I don't know what it's, it's worth. Well, to talk about anti-corruption, uh, it, it's very wide subject, and uh, I, I am afraid I, if I have to get on that, but we do have some very important cases in which the corruption of the judiciary is well established. But we can do nothing about it, given the number of cases. And if you are going to review these cases, you are going to review thousands of cases in Tunisia. I remember that two years ago in Australia, a judge was caught getting bribery and I think the Supreme Court of Australia annulled all the decisions he rendered during his career of 30 years. This is impossible in Tunisia. We have about two million and a half decisions uh, in Tunisia every year. So are we going to review uh, over the 50 years of independence? <laughs> thousands and thousands of cases, it's impossible. But it's, it's very, very frustrating, I tell you that, because you read the decision, you know that there was some 
way of corruption, uh, some kind of corruption in these decisions, but uh, we are helpless uh, before this situation. There is a, a ju uh, juridical security that should prevail, otherwise everything would, you know, blow up. Uh, I'm not sure I uh, understand your question about uh, the rule of law. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you're saying that the changes took place outside the formal legal system. And if so, were they more or less inclusive than had they gone through the formal legal system and more or less progressive if they had gone through? I'm just curious. Well, we are living in a transitional situation. And I think it's acceptable to me that this change can be initiated outside the traditional legal system, as long as it is accepted by the society. There was no reaction against it. So, practically speaking, it should exist uh, these uh, parallel channels. Mr. Anabi, thank you very much. I know you've stayed well beyond. Thank um, you very much. What you'd committed. What, thank what you, what you. I'm, I'm sorry I have to go and see my doctor. This is why, otherwise I could have stayed longer. But I'll be back tomorrow, I hope. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. In the interest of trying to get everybody out of this room no more than a half hour late, I would like to immediately give the word to Mr. Joel Martin. And it will be less than a half an hour late. Um, I really just want to make a couple of points uh, because uh, you all have been attentive and patient. Um, the program that I'm involved in uh, is something that is, we hope, supplementary to uh, what the uh, Institute of uh, Magistrature does. We hope that it's supplementary to what happens in the law schools, but we think it's also important and that it can stand on its own feet. We talk about the independence of the judiciary. That's our topic, that's our focus, and the IBA in its, in its uh, uh, half-month programs uh, talks about that and also about uh, international human rights um, treaties. But the independence of the judiciary is a somewhat slippery term, it seems to me. First of all, one must make a distinction between the independence of judges as individuals and the independence of the judiciary as an institution. On the independence of judges, I've been really quite struck by the uh, uh, Tunisian judges with whom I've met, and that number is now up around 500. I've been quite struck by the uh, independence that they display personally. Now, I don't think that independence is something that is innate, but I think it can be learned. And part of the training of a judge is to learn that ability to think independently and to write and to act independently. Then there's the independence of the judiciary, which is different because the judiciary is an institution and must be protected in many ways if it's to be independent at all. Uh, one could be a very independent judge and yet still be sent to uh, some far court in the south of Tunisia as punishment um, because the judiciary itself is not independent. So that's a distinction that we, that we try to draw very quickly and very often. <clears throat> Everybody talks about independence. Some of the most repressive uh, uh, administrations in the world commit themselves to the independence of the judiciary. Everybody says it. And sometimes you can believe it and sometimes you can't. Um, if it's to be serious, taken seriously, then it has to go through some of the processes that Tunisia is going through now. Um, as the, as the uh, uh, Chief Justice said this morning, this is not simple, it is not uh, easy, it isn't quick, and what we're seeing now, I believe, in our program is uh, a stage in the progress in which the judges with whom I meet anyway are, uh, are very important and are committed. It's extremely useful that we have people like Ivana who come to our uh, sessions and talk about what happened in the Czech Republic or in Croatia or in Estonia or other countries that have gone through this transition because it simply isn't, uh, it isn't unique, um, although every one of these transitions is different. 
And it's important, I think, for our judges to see what can be done. It takes a long time. In the Czech Republic, it was probably 15 years and maybe even 20 before the Union of Judges had organized itself enough so that it could speak with one voice for the judges. It takes time. It takes a lot of energy. Um, Kara and I now have met with about 1,000 of the 2,000 judges in, in Tunisia, and I think we can say that there is enough critical mass in that group uh, to make us really quite optimistic about, about the future. It's not assured, but the judges that we see are full of optimism and energy, and they have expressed to us uh, their commitment uh, to the independence of the judiciary and their willingness to work for it. There are also other signs outside what the judges do. The new constitution is a, is a very good instrument in that regard. Um, the establishment of Supreme Judicial Council is a very important step forward for Tunisia uh, because that has simply not been, uh, uh, not been an organization available to protect judges and to be in charge of uh, promotions and appointments and so on. So, these are, are good signs. I think that the, um, uh, none, of the, none of the individual signs is complete in itself, but taken together, they seem to me to be quite positive indications for the future of the country. And that is all that I will say. Thanks very much, Joel, for your patience and your brevity. Uh, I do not want this to become a panel of attrition, but if there are any burning questions that are out there and everyone is willing to stay and listen to them and you're willing to stay and answer them, then I suspect we could maybe take a single round of questions before we go. Uh, we could do this in a democratic way. Any nays? That was, that was not fair. Um, okay, let's take a few questions. Rolf, you had your hand up. Yes, I'm Rolf Ring from the Raoul Wallenberg Institute in Lund, Sweden, and uh, I would like to start to echoing some of what has been said that uh, basically I think uh, you have pointed to a number of factors which are extremely relevant for training, training judges. Uh, one thing which was discussed this morning was also, and I want to have your comments on that, is sort of the training uh, of young judges when they leave the judicial training academies and go to the to as associate judges in in court i think that is something which is equally important or even more important than sort of the formal training the formal training is important i think that's one part the, the dialogue the professional dialogue is something which should be emphasized and i think that's something sharing experience professional to professional i think that's the most uh, useful rather than having some, uh, an academic coming and lecturing on the, on the basic principle, because those, those uh, most judges already know. Uh, the prerequisite is for, uh, for an independent judiciary is the, the rule of law. And I want to make a little ad for a publication which we have done, and it's translated, and it's uh, a practical guide on the rule of law for politicians, because politicians need also to be aware of of the rule of law uh, in order to enact the, the proper laws. And this uh, is a lot of translations available on our website, and you are most welcome to consult it. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, my name is Zbigniew Lasochik. I'm coming from Poland. I'm vice president of uh, International Senior Lawyers Project Europe. Um, since I'm Polish um, and I remember the regime, um, the former regime in Poland, I also have some, uh, some thoughts about uh, the independence of the judiciary. Because in, in Poland, the judges were totally dependent during the regime. But after the so-called soft revolution, uh, there was an emphasis on independence of the judiciary and independence of, of judges. But by this, we somehow forgot about the very important mission of, of courts and judges. The judges and courts are to serve people and serve justice. And all of a sudden, it appeared that the language that the courts uses is not understandable for people. 
It's, it's very difficult. There was no communication. Uh, we organized a, a, a workshop for judges and journalists, and they, they swapped the roles. And it appeared that they don't understand each other. Now we had uh, several cases where judges expressed their, not political, just to make sure that it's not, not political opinions, but, but they were open about the cases they had on, on the table. And they were accused that they went beyond the mission of judge. And there was huge debate in Poland about that. Is it within the limits of independence of the judiciary and, and independence of judge? So this is sort of a lesson we learned, and this is a message for maybe for, for Tunisia, not to forget about the, the basic mission of, of, the, of the judiciary and, and judges, to serve people and to serve justice. Thank you very much. Any other questions, comments? Yes. Just a quick one. Uh, it's to the director of the institute here. Do you allow in your training program anything called mentoring where people who have been trained to serve as judges go to courts and they sit and learn from sitting judges? And whether in that same context you allow some international participation? Okay. Any more questions? Great. Okay. The floor is open. Shukran. Thank you. I will try, in fact, to come up with answers to the questions uh, uh, raised and the comments made. I shall start with the last uh, question raised. Right now, in the uh, bylaws of the High Institute of the Magistrates, there is a, a training course in the second year in the tribunals because the study lasts two years, one year at the institute and one in the courts and then the judge is nominated and there is some mo effective monitoring uh, by the uh, supervisors of the courts and the, the senior uh, judges and the senior judges. And at the level of the institute, uh, uh, what I've just uh, talked about, uh, continuous training for six years. What, uh, we as what we are aspiring to within the pro project is to set up a body that would be entrusted with coordination between the courts and the institute to uh, promote this training and to continue uh, permanent training up to the end. Uh, of course, within the framework of the training process. I do not, uh, we uh, prefer this kind of continuation between the Tunisian judicial institutions and the international and regional institutions. Uh, this has been done, and it is now uh, the case. Many judges uh, attend many training sessions in different areas of the world within the same respect and framework. Uh, the question before this question pertained to servicing the uh, uh, cause of justice. This is what made me say at the beginning of my speech uh, after the uh, comment of Mr. Annebi, we have to uh, consider th things in a relative way because within the framework of structural adjustments, uh, there was a control by uh, a sort of domination of the uh, executive authority over the institutions and the courts. But the judges uh, were not always sub 
subjected and submitted to the instructions or obedient to the instructions of the executive authority because they were uh, they were adamant that they were serving justice for uh, many many years for decades the issue relating to this uh, and that has been uh, uh, raised pertains to the financial resources Undoubtedly, financial resources are more than necessary. And uh, what uh, Mr. Annebi has said is right, that the judge uh, were not paid uh, good salaries up to the 1980s. Things have improved ever since, indeed. Uh, but uh, this was the result of some continuous requests and struggles as of the 1970s on part of the judges. And uh, this increase in salaries happened on several stages. And uh, so far, what are the requests of the judges? Their request is uh, they should not be compared to the rest of executive staff uh, so that the judge and this is one of the important element of independence uh, why should the judge uh, should have a very good salary so that the judge can be safe of any temptation and uh, so uh, this is an element of the elements of, uh, uh, and it's not the only element for independence because as an evidence those judges who have been independent over decades used to get paid the same salaries that were given back then. Uh, this is uh, what I've said in the beginning. In the current system, uh, at the level of the Constitution, we have the principle that has become constitutional. The non-transfer of the judge unless the judge expresses consent. Uh, and therefore, it's no longer possible for the judge uh, who uh, may anger the executive authority and is transferred to the south or to remote place. This is no longer possible because there is now constitutional guarantees in the 2014 constitution. In addition, there's uh, other uh, guarantees in the constitution and the law that uh, instituted the uh, body and that nomination can only be done by the provisional body overseeing civilian justice and in the constitution by the upper judicial council and therefore the executive power has no say at this level. Moreover, this uh, provisional body which is now preparing for the next uh, judge transfer and their promotion has issued uh, a statement about uh, defining the criteria for the judicial transfer uh, about to be done on which criteria uh, a judge can be promoted or nominated in a given court. Uh, the criteria have been set uh, and they were addressed to all judges. So at this transitional period, there are some gains and accomplishments at this level. And I would conclude by making a remark regarding the public prosecution. Once again, the Constitution the Constitution provided guarantees because the, now, the public prosecution is now, uh, legally speaking, is under the jurisdiction of the Minister of Justice. Uh, this is true by virtue of the Code of Criminal Procedures. But uh, uh, I think that this is no longer of uh, uh, big value because the constitution supersedes the national law and uh, in the uh, now in the uh, provisions of the constitution uh, we defined the duties of the public prosecution today the uh, public prosecution department is part of the civilian justice uh, 
uh, it is covered by the guarantees and the provisions of guarantees in the Constitution, and the judges of the public prosecution uh, carry out their duties as uh, per law and within the framework uh, and within a framework that guarantees to a certain extent the independence of the public prosecution from the executive power with regard to the criminal policy of the state. Uh, the state's criminal policy is the one that is enforced by the public prosecutors. Therefore, they are not required to enforce the criminal uh, policy of the executive power because there's a difference between the state and the executive power. And therefore, I believe that it, there, there has been a profound change as long as we assume that the Constitution supersedes the national laws and domestic laws. So the role of the public prosecution is to carry out the policy of the, the criminal policy of the state and not the instructions of the Minister of Justice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, would you like to add anything, Joel? No. Ivana? Okay. I think we have come to the end of a long but very fruitful session. Um, and uh, it has been fascinating to observe the role um, that the trainings that we've been able to assist with have played in a much broader um, uh, debate about independence and its meaning in international norms and in Tunisia. Um, I would like to close by saying that I believe all of our speakers have qualified themselves supremely for the award of a Swedish dollar horse. And we have qualified ourselves uh, to go out and stretch our legs. Um, but I hope that we'll be able to continue in private conversations this discussion.